and my rajesh tutor for biology today i will be covering organisms and population and uh, ecosystem together in one session so we are going to have two lessons combined together briefly i will run through how to access revision notes and test in basics.com go to classics.com click on practice So you will see a lot of packages. In this, select one package. Since we are doing new classes, we will select on new premium. I will be covering organisms and population and ecosystem as a single unit. So briefly, I will run through how to access revision notes and test in classics.com. Open the classics.com page. Click on practice. So you will be seeing lot of packages. You can select the package you want. Since we are doing meat, we will be doing uh, selecting on the premium package. So if you look at it, you will be having a uh, test chapter wise here for uh, full test. So if you just click on these tests, you will see different colored bubbles. Each bubble is going to uh, show you a test. The green bubble indicates that you have already completed the test, but you can always visit any number of times you want to visit the test. And blue bubble indicates that you are yet to take a test and you have Have not taken the test. Yellow bubble indicates it's an incomplete uh, test. Sometimes you would have started the test, but after three or four questions, you would have realized it. You are not really geared up for the test, and you need to learn the concepts. So you might discontinue. No, then it is an indication that you had to come and complete it. And once you are completed, you see different number of tests are there in different chapters, depending upon the complexity of the text and also its importance and need. Once you have completed all this, you can take the red bubble test, which is a randomized test. So this will help you to analyze your strengths and weaknesses by making you understand whether you have understood the concept and its application in detail. Now I am about to know how to navigate the website. In today's class, I will be re uh, revising the key concepts, do a practice test based on the concepts learned, and in the last five minutes, I shall answer your queries. Now, before going into the revision notes, let us look into type of questions. I'm sure you are all facing the, you are going to face your NEET exams, and you are worried about the kind of questions that will feature in the exam. Basically, with our analysis, we have realized it that there are three kinds of uh, uh, questions that are featuring in your uh, NEET exams. First one, 60 to 68 to 70 questions will be directly from NCERT book. So that if you are thorough with NCERT meticulously, it will be very easy for you to understand and answer the questions. Now, if you have done the past year's papers meticulously, around eight to ten questions will be featured again, and that will really help you to 
get marks if you have solved all the problems of the past papers and around 8 to 10 questions will be very new and they become the game changer if this is but again if you look at it it will all be based on ncert all you have to understand is how to understand the question apply the concept and give the answer right now i hope you have got this framework now let us get back to the revision so when you click this button it will open into neat revision and that this revision has been prepared by the tutors taking into consideration the key concepts that are very very essential from neat point of view i know it's very difficult for you to read all the 10 books which you have for grade 11 and 12 in physics chemistry and biology together at the end before the day of the exam to help you to revise thoroughly to help you to understand things quickly and do things quickly these neat uh, revision notes have been now uh, prepared and this has got just around uh, 135 pages that will cover all your uh, chapters so this would be an answer for your study material and the package that if you go through the test that will really help you to score very high marks in your exam let us start with today's uh, lesson i told you i'm going to club two chapters and then give a single test so this is organisms and population so these are uh, so this is to deal with ecology now the term ecology was introduced by winter in the year 1868 and ernest hackel defined it as the study of natural environment including the relationships of the organism with one another and to their surroundings ramdev mishra ramdev mishra is known as the father of indian ecology he defined it as the interaction of form functions and factors auto ecology is the branch of ecology which is concerned with the study of individual organisms cell ecology is the branch of ecology which deals with the study of group of organisms that are associated together as a unit now let us look at organisms and the environment so you know what are organisms organisms from the basic unit of study in ecology organisms with similar features and potential will interbreed amongst themselves and produce fertile egg ones and these together are termed as the species now population refers to population is a group of of the same species inhabiting a given area inter specific competition will be seen for basic needs among the individuals of a population now let us look at habit now you know the very organisms uh, will be surviving in different kinds of uh, biomes so how do these biomes what is a biome so biome is a very large unit constituting of a major vegetation type and associated fauna which is found in a specified zone for example if you look at equatorial region you will be having equatorial climate you will find certain kinds of plants certain kinds of animals living similarly in the temperate biomes you will be finding some kinds of organisms surviving even in the deserts so in the deserts you will find xerophytes and uh, animals like camels and uh, snakes and rodents that can survive in the extreme heat conditions so what causes all these changes of the for the biomes to change it is the annual variation in the intensity duration of temperature and precipitation which accounts for the formation of major biomes now major biomes of india is very important if you should know this tropical rain forest deciduous forest the desert sea coast regional and local variations within each biome will lead to the formation of newer wide varieties of habitats now let us look into habitat and niche habitat is the place where an organism lives it represents a place suitable for its successful ecological niche of an organism includes the physical space is occupied by it its functional Community and the conditions of existence. Now, ecological niche. Each species has its own unique niche. No two species cannot occupy can occupy exactly the same niche, and they can coexist. So, if at all you might see two species living together, 
clear that actually their niche would be very very different closely related species of competitors will have similar requirements along the niche dimensions so that their niche will overlap one another partially or fully if that happens there will definitely be competition if the niche of one species completely overlaps that of the other then one If niche overlaps partially, coexistence is possible. If that is possible, where one species fully occupies its own fundamental niche, excluding the second species from parts of its fundamental niche, and leaving it to occupy a smaller realized niche. So. It's going to occupy a major portion, and then a smaller portion will be the niche for the second species. Or both species can have restricted realized niches, each utilizing a smaller range of particular niche dimensions. Then they would be in the absence of the other species. So this is very important. So basically, if you understand from this, you will understand habitat is the address of an organism, and niche is the profession it does to seek its. Now let us look at the environmental factors. So you know the habitat includes both biotic and abiotic factors. Biotic factors mostly influence growth and reproduction. It contains plants, animals, microbes, and all these interact amongst one another. Abiotic factors include temperature, water, light, and soil. Temperature bounds the function and geographical distribution of the organisms. some organisms are eutrophic while others are steamothermal water is an important factor for life organisms can which can tolerate a wide range of salinity they you call them as uri aligned the term if you look at the word prefix uri uri means having a wide tolerance to any of the abiotic factor if it is uri aligned that means to say it has a wide tolerance to high temperatures or wide range of temperatures steamothermal alignments Can tolerate only a narrow salinity. So steam, or the word prefix, if you come across steam, or that means it represents a narrow range. Now light influences life on Earth as plants prepare food and release oxygen during photosynthesis. Soil sustains life on Earth. The physical and chemical properties of soil, such as grain size, porosity, pH, and mineral composition, determine the type of plant that can grow in a particular habitat. Now, what are the responses to abiotic factors? How do organisms really respond to these abiotic factors? Based on that, we have got regulators and conformers. Regulators are organisms that are able to maintain homeostasis by physiological means, which ensures a constant body temperature, constant osmotic concentration. Examples are mammals and birds. and a very few lower vertebrates and invertebrates are regulators so mainly they will be able to regulate the temperature and also show osmoregulation now if you look at human beings they can maintain their body temperature by sweating profusely in summer and shivering during winter season but plants do not have such mechanisms to maintain internal body temperature now conformers majority of the animals and nearly all the plants cannot maintain a constant internal environment their body temperature changes with the ambient temperature so we call that such organisms as uh, poikilotherms in aquatic animals osmotic concentration of the body fluid also changes with that of the water and osmotic concentration some species have been able to regulate but only over a very limited range of environmental conditions beyond which they simply conform that means to say their body uh, temperature and the uh, osmolar osmolarity of the body also keeps changing along with that of the environment partial regulators now partial regulators will be able to partially regulate the temperature by having certain adaptations on their body for example hair on the body hair on the body acts as the heat insulator again surface area and volume ratio so in smaller organisms the surface area is quite large as compared to the volume but in large animals the ratio is small so large animals effectively control the body temperature now migration so organisms can move away temporarily from stressful habitat to a more hospitable area and return when the stressful period is over and this is what we call it as migration now you might have seen migratory birds visiting india during the 
summer and uh, winter seasons because the place where they live would have become very hostile for them so they might have taken up this migration and india would be a better spot for them so they come here breed and then get back to their original place now suspend so organisms may avoid the stress by escaping in the time now they have two kinds of sleep that is the winter sleep which is called as hibernation and summer sleep which is called as the estivation and sometimes organisms will also undergo if the environmental conditions are unfavorable they just uh, stop all their uh, period activities of the body and they suspend everything and that is what we call it as diapause now let us look at the next concept age pyramids and population so population if you take the term population it is a unit of biotic community made up of near permanent group of individual interbreeding individuals of a species found in a space at a particular time now what are the different characteristics of a population a population has got certain attributes that an individual will not have for example birth rate so an individual will not have a birth rate or the mortality death rate that is mortality sex ratio and population density so these are the characteristics of the population now in any population you will find three kinds of age groups one is in the pre reproductive stage second is reproductive stage and then the post reproductive stage if the pre reproductive stage in the number of organisms in pre reproductive stages are high then you call it as an expanding population when compared to reproductive and post reproductive so which is uh, most common and but it might not be possible all the time and then an ideal condition would be a stable a uh, state wherein both pre uh, reproduction and reproduction phase almost have same kind of number of organisms so, reproductive phase and reproductive phase will move the post reproductive phase so in this way there is a balance in the uh, uh, yeah, populations and the next one is the declining population it is then adverse condition and you look at the pre reproductive stage it is very very less reproductive stage is there and re post reproductive is almost very near to reproductive that means once people have passed on from the reproductive stage to post reproductive stage there will be no reproduction because there are very few individuals who are in pre reproductive stage who will move on to the reproductive stage so in this condition the population will start declining so that is why we have one name them as an expanding or a growing population a stable population and a declining population and this is very very important for you you should understand this uh learn it how it goes and that's why i help you how to analyze each and every pyramid because they might ask you in the exam give you the figures and ask you see they will not ask you in the same order it will be twisted so don't be under the impression the first one will be expanding second is stable third is declining no they can ask you in any order but you should know how to interpret the pyramid if it the base is broader then it is pre reproductive if pre reproductive and reproductive are almost similar then it is stable if pre reproductive is smaller then it is declining now let us look at the population growth population growth depends on factors like food availability weather predation pressure and competition the density of population in a given habitat changes due to four basic processes natality mortality immigration and emigration so natality i said it is the birth rate so number of births that happen mortality is number of deaths that happen immigration means organisms from some other area moving into the area under consideration thereby increasing the count of the organisms here so the population will increase emigration means moving from one place to another as a result of which the number of organisms in the population under check or under count or under consideration will become lesser so now the equation for the population growth can be given as uh, nt plus 1 is equal to nt plus b plus i minus b plus e where nt is equal to population density at time t b is the birth rate i is the immigration d is the death rate and e is emigration the maximum population of species that a particular environment can carry we call it as the 
carrying capacity. Now the population growth models are exponential growth models and logistic growth model. When the resource availability is limited, see here that is what we are looking at. When the resource availability is limited, then it grow, uh, is unlimited in the habitat. The population will grow in an uh, exponential manner. So the equation will become nt is equal to n naught e r e to the power of r t. It is a J-shaped curve is obtained when responses are not limiting the growth. Any species can grow exponentially in resources condition and can reach enormous population densities in a short time, but the growth is not so realistic. Whirlist for logistic cover up model, if you look at it. K by dt is equal to Rn into K minus N divided by N, where N is the population density at time t, R is the intrinsic rate of natural increase, and K is the carrying capacity. Here you will obtain a sigmoid delta curve, and here the resources are limiting the growth. It is the resources for growth for most animal populations I know, and then they become limiting and this is the more realistic one. So the sigmoidal curve is the more realistic one because organisms are not kept in an isolated thing where they are able to understand where they are able to grow on their own. That does not happen. So it is important you learn these two graph. This graph is also very important and you should also learn the equations. Now let us look at how the organism population and its sum interactions of the population. Before we get in, you need to understand these are some of the definitions which they will uh, ask you. Population interactions. One is the predation. So predation means it's an interaction between species involving killing and consumption of prey. The species which eats the other is called a predator. This called as the prey. Predator keeps check on prey population. The reduction in predation population, predator population may lead to increase in prey population. Now, what are the examples? Biological control methods to control the pest. Then carnivores like tigers eating deer, snake eating frog, etc. Insectivorous plants like Nepenthes, Drosera, Articularia, etc. Now, the next one will be the competition. In this, fitness of one species is significantly lower in the presence of another species. So the one which is fit will be selected by nature and that becomes the uh, victorious one and other will be vanquished. So you have to understand what is competition. A species whose distribution is restricted to a small geographical area because of a competitively superior species is found to expand its distributional range when the competing species is experimentally removed. This is what we call it as competitive release. So you please make a note of this definition. With using this concept, they might give you a situation and ask you to identify. Then the correct answer will be competitive release. Competitive exclusion principle. Two closely related species competing for the same resources cannot coexist indefinitely and the competitively inferior one will get eliminated. Now resource, of part, resource partitioning. If two species compete for the same resource, they can avoid competition by choosing different times for feeding. Now these are some things about competition you have to learn. The next is commensalism. Conventionalism is the interspecific interaction where one species is benefited while the other species is neither benefited nor harmed. If you look at uh, examples, clownfishes living among the tentacles of sea anemone. So clownfishes will be able to move from, uh, will be protected because no organism will come near the tentacles of the sea anemone and when sea anemone is moving it also gets passively carried away. Pilot fish accompany shark. Sharks it's not going to help shark in any way but pilot fish is getting protected and it is also able to move very easily without the fear of its predators. Orchid growing on the mango tree. So orchids will grow as epiphytes and orchids are benefited by getting shelter while tree is neither benefited nor harmed. Sea anemone on the shell of the the hermit trap, barnacles on the back of the whales. So they get a free ride. Egret and grazing cattle. So when the egrets you might have seen on the 
Nothing will happen to the cattle. They will be getting worms or some things that the cattle doesn't need, but will be acting as a food for them. Now, parasitism. It's a kind of relationship between two species in which one derives its food from the other. Parasitism involves shelter in addition to food obtained by a parasite. Parasites can be ectoparasites or endoparasites. Now, examples of parasitism are cascuta growing in the shoe flower plant, head louse on the human. So you know they can be exoparasites or endoparasites. Now, if you look at Ascaria. Ascaristenia and Plasmodium, they are all present within the intestine of the human intestine and they cause diseases in the humans. Now, brood parasitism, that means to say here, the one of the bird will not be able to lay an egg, it does any egg. What it does is, it lays the eggs in the nest of the other bird species and the other bird is not able to differentiate between its own nest, uh, own egg and the other bird's egg. And it is how crow lays its egg in the crow's nest. Crow will think it is all these are uh, crow's uh, eggs and it will start tending until it hatches and comes out to be a cuckoo. Next example is, next kind of uh, interaction is mutualism. Here, mutual means each other. So here, both the interactions are benefited mutually and it is known as Symbiosis. Examples of mutants include mycorrhiza that are living in the roots of the higher plants. So you know fungus can get in a, a symbiotic relationship with the roots of higher plants and help in nitrogen fixation. Rhizobium in the root nodules of legumes, algae and fungi in lichens, orchid offers and bee for pollination. Now they imply the sexual desert. Wherein the bee thinks the orchid flower will look like a female uh, thing, a female uh, bee, and the male bee thinks that it is a female reason for copulation. But actually, when it is coming and uh, uh, trying to mate the orchid of frisk, it is going to shed all the pollen it has collected from the flower, other orchid, and this brings about pollination. And this is what we call it as sexual deceit. Now, co-evolution, fig species and wasp is an example. Here, female wasp uses the fruit as an OB deposition and also uses the developing seeds within the fruits for nourishing its larvae. Wasp pollinates the fig inflorescence while searching for egg-laying site and in turn, big offer, and in turn, the fig will offer developing seeds as food for the developing larvae. Example, again, you can give for co-evolution, even orchid offerings and bee are also co-evolved with each other. Now, amensalism, it's an interaction between two different species in which one species is harmed and the other is neither benefited nor harmed. Example could be Pencilium, whose toxins kill many bacteria. It's neither benefited nor harmed. So, you know, Pencilium is obtained from the fungus Penicillium notatum. Now, this uh, com adaptations, you should know, it is any attribute of an organism which could be morphological, physiological and behavioral that enables the organism to survive and reproduce in its habitat. Many adaptations have evolved over a long evolutionary time and are genetically fixed. For example, in the absence of external source of water, kangaroo rat in North American deserts is capable of meeting all its requirements through its internal fat oxidation. Tribes living at high altitudes have a higher count and human global and high vital capacity than people living in plains. Now with this we complete uh, the organisms and population. Now let us look into ecosystem. Optimal unit of nature where living organisms interact among themselves and also with the surrounding physical environment. Ecosystems can be classified into terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems and uh, every ecosystem as non-living and living components. So, biotic and abiotic components are a must for an ecosystem. Now, biotic components includes autotrophic components, heterotrophic components and decomposers. So, if we look at uh, producers, they are the autotrophic components, macro consumers and micro consumers. Autotrophic components are mainly constituted by green plants, algae and all photosynthetic organisms. Chemosynthetic bacteria, photosynthetic bacteria, algae, grass, mushrooms, whatever you think of under the plant kingdom, they all are autotrophs. 
heterotrophic components cannot make their own food they consume the matter built by the producers and therefore we call them as consumers they may be herbivores carnivores or omnivores herbivores are called primary consumers whereas carnivores and omnivores are called secondary consumers collectively we call all these things as macro consumers now these composers are also heterotrophic organisms comprising of bacteria and fungi and they break down the complex compounds of dead protoplasm absorb some of the products and release simple substances usable by the producers now let us look at the abiotic components abiotic components of an ecosystem consists of non living substances and factors it could be inorganic substances organic substances and climatic regime or the factors that control the climate here also you know inorganic substances could be carbon nitrogen sulfur potassium carbon dioxide water etc organic substances could be proteins carbohydrates liquids etc climatic regime can be temperature humidity soil light pressure etc now let us look at uh, the climatic region temperature it ranges in different parts of the earth it has created different sized uh, zones now light provides solar energy to the ecosystem for photosynthesis and also for heating up the earth now wind controls weather transpiration pollination and dissemination of propagules humidity controls the formation of clouds dew fog etc precipitation may occur as rainfall snow dew hail etc now let us look at the functions of the ecosystem now you should understand there are four major functions of ecosystem one is productivity second is decomposition third is energy flow and fourth is nutrient cycling the rate of biomass production is called as productivity now there are three kinds you have to understand primary productivity gross primary productivity and net primary productivity so primary productivity is expressed as the amount of biomass or organic matter produced per unit area over a time period by plants during photosynthesis secondary productivity is the rate of formation of new organic matter by consumers the annual net primary productivity of the whole biosphere is approximately 170 billion tons of organic matter now let us look at decomposition the decomposers break down complex organic matter into organic substances like carbon dioxide water and nutrients and this process is called decomposition again the steps are fragmentation leaching catabolism humification and mineralization now if we look at uh, fragmentation fragments means breaking down in fragmentation refers to breaking down into smaller pieces due to the action of the detritus uh, eating invertebrates that is detritivores which causes it to break into smaller particles detritus gets pulverized when passing through the digestive tract of animals due to fragmentation surface area of the detritus particles is greatly increased second step is leaching the process by which nutrient chemicals or contaminants are dissolved and carried away by water and are moved into the lower layer of the soil catabolism the extracellular enzymes released by bacteria and fungi carry out catabolism that is enzymatic conversion of the decomposing detritus to simpler compounds and inorganic substances it is important to know that all the three decomposition process operate simultaneously on the detritus humification and mineralization occurs uh, together during decomposition humification leads to accumulation of a dark colored amorphous substance called humus humus is highly resistant to microbial action and undergoes extremely slow decomposition it serves as a reservoir of nutrients minerals and available nutrients in the soil the process by which soil nutrients get tied up with the biomass of microbes and become temporarily unavailable to other organisms we call this situation as nutrient immobilization nutrients will remain immobilized for variable periods and they get mineralized later after the death of the microbes this immobilization prevents the nutrients from 
they evolved out from the ecosystem. So now we have understood what how this uh, process of decomposition takes place. And you should remember that it is not that after fragmentation leaching will take place or after leaching catabolism. That is totally it is going to take place. No, in different parts, different uh, activities will be going on depending upon the kind of materials that need to be recycled. Now let us look at energy flow. So energy flow is the key function in the ecosystem. In an ecosystem, energy is transferred in the form of food and it leads to the degradation and loss of major part of food energy as heat during metabolic activities and very small fraction becomes stored as biomass. There are two types of food chains. One is the grazing food chain, the other is detritus food chain. So grazing food chain will start with the producer and uh, ends with a top carnivore. Detritus food chain will begin with uh, dead organic matter. It is made up of decomposers like bacteria and fungi. They meet their energy and nutrient requirements by degrading the detritus and it is also known as the saprophytic food chain. Now let us look at the food chains. Food chains are not isolated units but are hooked together in the form of food webs. In an ecosystem, interlinking pattern of number of food chains form a web-like arrangement known as the food web. Now, before we look into the next concept, let us look into the differences between grazing food chain and detritus food chain. In grazing food chain, chain begins with producers as the first trophic level. Here, the chain begins with the detritus and decomposers as the first trophic level. Inner food chain comes from the sun in grazing food chain. But in detritus food chain, it organic remains of detritus. Food chain energy to the ecosystem in grazing food chain. But in detritus, it retrieves the food energy from the detritus and so it's wastage. The food chain is of the inorganic nutrients in grazing food chain. But in recycling pool. So this is the differences we have to know. Now let us look into nutrient cycling. The nutrients are never lost from an ecosystem, but are recycled time and again indefinitely. The amount of nutrients that is like uh, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, etc. that are present in the soil at any given point of time, we call it as standing state. Now, new cycles are of two types, gaseous cycle and sedimentary cycle. So, gaseous cycle exists in the atmosphere. carbon cycle and nitrogen cycle. Sedimentary cycle exists in the earth's crust. Example, phosphorus cycle and sulfur cycle. Now, let us look at carbon cycle. It occurs through atmosphere, ocean and through living and uh, dead organisms. Considerable amount of carbon returns to atmosphere as carbon dioxide through respiratory activities. Decomposers also contribute to carbon dioxide pool. When wood is burnt or when there is a forest fire or when there is combustion of organic matter or fossil fuels are being burnt or volcanic activity, they all release carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that is taken up by the green plants. And then that is uh, how the food, cha food is getting, uh, so food energy is passed on from one to another in the food chain and the food web. And again, carbon dioxide gets back into the atmosphere. So this is a gaseous cycle. Now sedimentary cycle, let us look at, it exists in the earth's crust, as I said. Now let us look at phosphorus cycle. Now here, if you look at the phosphorus cycle, what happens? Producers to consumers to detritus on decomposition, they get into the soil solution. Rock minerals also on weathering will add on to the soil. Soil it is uptake, but it is took up by it is taken up by the producers, and there is also runoff. So this is the phosphorus cycle. So let us now look at the uh, ecological pyramids. So ecological pyramids are the graphic representations of the trophic structure and functions at successive trophic levels. Now we have seen that uh, ecological pyramids can be shown in terms of their number, biomass, energy content. And the concept of this pyramid was proposed by Charles Eriton. And so they are also known as Eritonian pyramids. Now there are three kinds of pyramids as I said. Pyramid of number. It represents the number of individuals per unit area of various trophic levels. 
Pyramid of biomass represents the biomass present sequentially per unit area of different trophic levels. Pyramid of energy represents amount of energy trapped per unit area and time in different trophic levels of a food chain. Now the next concept will be ecological succession. Ecological succession is a natural which different groups and colonies colonize the same area over a period of time in a definite sequence. Kamek's community is the community that is the final terminal community that can maintain itself more or less infinitely in equilibrium with the prevailing environment. Now, there are many theories. One theory is monoclimax theory. According to that, there is only one climax community which is chiefly controlled by the climate. Polyclimax theory says that there can be more than one type of climax communities and each differing widely from each other in the same climatic conditions at a time. Now, there are two kinds of successions you have to know. One is the primary succession, the second is secondary succession. Primary succession takes place where no life existed uh, before. So this is the kind of uh, ecological pyramids. So this is the grassland ecosystem. All rise and pyramid of energy will always be upright. This is the pyramid of biomass. Now let us look at uh, Successions. Primary succession is a very slow process that takes thousands of years for the establishment of climax community. In secondary succession, the type of pioneer species depends on the condition of the soil, availability of water, environmental conditions, seeds and other propagules that are present. Now with this, these are the chief concepts that we had to cover in this concept and today we have done that. Now let us go and look into the Okay, due to extinction of a pollinator bee, a plant with obligate mutualism with this bee extincts and this can be placed in which uh, cause of extinction? It is co extinct. The other also becomes extinct because of its dependence, so it is co-extinction. Which of these is not a habitat? High mountain tops, boiling thermal springs, human intestine, sterile beaker. Sterile beaker. Which of the following is ecologically most uh, relevant abiotic factor? It is temperature. It organism through its effect on enzyme kinetics because you know that enzymes are affected very much by the temperature. At very low temperatures, they will not function and at very high temperature, enzymes become denatured. Salinity of inland waters is around 5 parts per trillion. Thermoregulation will be expensive for animals with large surface area and small volume. So the choice will be 1 and 2. So A has got both 1 and 2. So that is the correct answer. Zooplanktons react to unfavorable conditions via that's why I said that's the stage where during unfavorable conditions, these organisms will suspend all their metabolic activities and that suspended state of metabolism is known as diapause. Organisms can, sorry. Organisms can move away temporarily 
So when stressful habitat to a more hospitable area and return when stressful period is over. It's not area when the stressful period is over and it is called migration. Breeding once in the lifetime specific fish. Breeding several times in lifetime most of the birds. Large number of small size of springs, oysters. Small number of large size of springs, mammals. So in this, let us look into the choice. A is 4, B is uh, 3. So A is 4, B is 3. C, large number of oysters, yeah. So this is the answer. Photosynthetic organ of Opentia is stem. Mammals from colder climate generally have shorter ears than used to minimize heat, lo heat loss and this is known as Allen's rule. Which character of species is not susceptible to extinction? So high reproductive uh, rate, if the species has high reproductive rate, then it is not susceptible to extinction. A group of organisms will have well defined geographical area, share a group for similar resources, potentially interbreed, and uh, these are known as population. Okay, 14 one. Which of the following is correct? That is NT plus 1 is equal to NT plus D plus I minus D plus E. So this is the correct choice. Number of births during a given period of time in a population is called natality. So we can end the test here. So here all our answers are right. You see that if everything is correct, you will be seeing only the green uh, tiles. And once, uh, if it is any question is incorrect, you will see a red colored uh, tile. And you just click on that question, it will take you to the correct answer. There it will also highlight your answer and also the correct answer. Explanation is given so that you are aware of your mistake. If you are not attempted, you are going to see a yellow tile. And uh, children, since you are going to give neat exams and it is negative correction, if you are not sure of the answer, don't take randomly because it's going to cost you minus one mark from your total. So it is better you avoid if you do not know the question because you are not going to lose minus one mark. So with this we complete uh, today's class. Now if you look at our uh, neat full test, it has got 38 full tests. In this test, 15 tests are teacher created, tutors are created it, taking into consideration the three kinds of questions and uh, the important uh, concepts that are required for need and the remaining 20 odd tests are based on uh, past papers. All these are fully solved with explanations. So it would be an asset if you go through all these things, you will be able to prepare thoroughly for your need. If you want to ask anything, if you have a query, use our ask feature. And we also support students group on uh, chat on uh, Telegram. In case if you want to have one-to-one -one, uh, 
the MOCA slot with the tutors. And if you have further inquiries, you can always mail to info at k6.com and we will be able to get all your uh, queries uh, resolved. And uh, hope also, I hope to, this comes to an end of today's class. We catch up with tomorrow with our and complete this unit. Thank you.